All right, so I want to pick up with what um, we were talking about all of last week. Basically, we talked about sine waves. Sine waves are important. We have them all over the place. Audio signals, power, radio. And even if I don't have a sine wave, I probably have something that's a sum of sine waves as my, basically as my voltage and current sources in my circuit, like whatever, whatever the sources of energy are in my circuit, usually they're sinusoidal or they're periodic and they can be thought of as a sum of sine waves. That's beyond us in this class, but they'll talk about that in 2254 and 3111. That's called 4A analysis. So it's important. So we need to know how to do it. All right. And so we talked through basically last week, I gave a couple of examples where I gave circuits where I had sinusoidal sources and I did static circuits and dynamic circuits. The difference between a static and dynamic, static has only resistors. So whatever is gonna happen at time t equal to zero happens and it's, it never changes, okay? Dynamic circuits have R's, L's, and C's. If I have R's, L's, and C's and it's dynamic, what the heck does that mean to say that it's dynamic? What's different between a circuit with only resistors and one with resistors, capacitors, and inductors? Yeah. One has a transient. Which one has a transient? The ones with R's, L's, and C's. And how long does that transient last? Well, it depends on the circuit. Depends on what the values of R, L, and C are, right? But in general, how long does it last? Typically. Yeah. So five tau is if we have a first order system. It, usually, it's on the order of milliseconds. Yeah, might could be microseconds. Could be nanoseconds. All right. But generally, it's on the order of milliseconds. If it, it could be really big L's and C's, and it could be seconds. All right, but that doesn't happen that often. And if you think about my examples here, right? Audio signals, for instance, or the power waveforms, right? How long is, if I plug a load into the grid, let's say I plug in my computer, how long is my computer on? Well, hours probably. So whatever transients I have are over pretty quickly relative to how long things are on. So we typically only care about the steady state and so in steady state, if it's, a, if it's a static circuit, it doesn't really matter. This is what we looked at the other day. So I, I had a resistor divider. I said I simulated it in Simulink, and there's my two resistors in series with each other. Again, I asked the question just intuitively, V out and V in. Which one's supposed to be smaller? If it's a voltage divider, which one's smaller, V out or V in? V out's smaller, right? It's a divider, right? Now, the key thing is here, the blue is the input voltage. The red is the capacitor voltage. The yellow is the current. Quick observations about this. Are the frequencies all the same? Yes. All right. Is there any phase shift between them? No, there's no shifting of any of these waveforms. There's a change in the amplitude. So basically, I don't need to keep that sine 2 pi 100 T. I don't need that in my analysis. I can basically just do analysis for the amplitudes, right? Now, <clears throat> when we looked at the dynamic circuit, if I've got a dynamic circuit, that tells me Right off the bat, it's just write a differential equation. All right, and the differential equation has two pieces to its response. One part is the transient, one part is the steady state. Now, if I only care about the steady state, I don't need to look at the transient, all right? And in the steady state, what, this, what we looked at basically is, you know, we see that the transient is short, like we said, right? And then we get the steady state. And basically, if I look at, I did here for this circuit, which is basically an R and a C in series with each other. I said the source was cosine two pi FT. So what's the amplitude of cosine two pi FT? What's the amplitude of that? One, right? The amplitude of that is one. And I said, I wanna try a couple of different frequencies. So I did 0.1 Hertz, 10 Hertz, 1000 Hertz. All right, now in each of these graphs, the blue waveform, which I can't even see here, blue waveform is the input voltage, and the red waveform is the voltage across the capacitor. So as I look at these cases, what are a couple of observations that we have? What's true about the frequency of the input voltage and the output voltage? They're the same. Frequency's not changing, right? What's true about the amplitudes? The amplitude certainly changes. And it seems like the amplitude of the voltage across that capacitor depends on what? I'm using the same R and C in each case. But if I look at, say, here, here, and here, what seems to matter? Frequency. The frequency of the voltage that I have changes how big the capacitor voltage is. 
also changes how much of a shift there is, right? If I look here at 0.1 Hertz, they're basically the capacitor voltage and the input voltage, same size, same, they line up with each other almost entirely. Here, the capacitor voltage is a little bit smaller and it's shifted a little bit. Here, it's a lot smaller where it's a thousand Hertz and the shift works out to be about 90 degrees. It's about the maximum we're ever gonna see. All right, so I, I see that the, in general, right, if I only have resistors, the frequency stays the same, the phase stays the same, the amplitude could change. If I have capacitors and inductors, what I see is that the phase might change and the amplitude might change. And I wrote here, I keep using this word phase, right? What's that mean? That means the angle, the shift relative, all right? So basically the waveform can shift left or right, and the amplitude change means that it could be scaled bigger or smaller. All right, and that's basically the result that we that you saw in differential equations, where basically the steady state guess that I have is some amplitude cosine two pi ft, same frequency, but some phase shift. Okay, all right. So basically, the bottom line is if if I'm looking, if I'm only concerned about the steady state, I don't need to worry about the transient. That says right off the bat, hopefully, I can get rid of the differential equation. Important thing, too, is that the only thing that changes is the phase and the amplitude. What I said on Friday was I don't need to keep the time domain part in any of my analysis ever if I only care about the steady state response. So if I don't care about that, that led us to this idea the other day that I could talk about phasers, right? So I could use this idea of compression, right? I could basically say, you know what? I don't need to know the value of that waveform at every time t. So there's, I don't need the function X of T because how many points are there in X of T? How many values are there? If I, if I showed on this graph, how many values technically are there on my graph? Infinitely many. This is a continuous time function. This guy's got lots of points, but I don't need to worry about that. If the only things that can change are that it can shift left or right and it can get bigger or smaller, the only thing I need to do is to track the amplitude in the phase, because those are the only things that ever change. So this simplifies my analysis a lot, right? And so we use this concept of phasers. So for the waveform that I showed here, all right, so the blue here is, and I don't even know exactly what the frequency is in this case, I guess it's was 10 Hertz, right? So it's, I've got cosine two pi, 10 T like that. All right, and then this guy here is 0 0.707, well, to be consistent with what I wrote here, 0 0.7044 cosine 2 pi 10t minus 47 degrees, like that, okay? So what we did is we mapped those to phasers, okay? And so I see right there with the phasers, basically with phaser just track basically for me, it's a complex number. So if I have this kind of general form here where I said X of T is X M cosine omega T plus phi, what's the phasor for this guy? What's the phasor for that waveform? I would write this as capital X with I, and I write them with a bar under them, right? That's the way I always do it for a complex vector. I, what's, the, what's the magnitude and the angle of that thing? X of M is the magnitude and the angle is phi, okay? And so this is the example for this guy right here. What I see is the amplitude is one and the angle is zero. That's what I wrote here, okay? For this output voltage, 0 0.7044 cosine two pi 10 T minus 47 degrees. I say this guy is 0 0.7044 with an angle of negative 47. And the negative 47 makes, makes sure he points into what quadrant there? What quadrant's down here? Fourth. Okay. Um, one question that I, I would have kind of thought you guys were on, let's say I gave you a vector like this, negative one plus three J. What vector is negative one plus three J? What quadrant is that in? Two. What's the angle? Well, here, I'm actually take it simpler. Negative one plus one J. What, that's in the second quadrant as well. What's its angle? One thirty-five. He said, "Okay, that is correct, right?" 
if I, how would, how did, so you figured that out by looking at it, I guess, just thinking about it, right? If you didn't know, how would you figure out what the angle was? How do you guys know how to figure out the angle of a phaser? Yeah. Will that work? It will not work. Why not? This is set you up for it. Um, it will not work, right? Why not? Inverse tangents only defined in two quadrants, right? Inverse tangents only defined for angles that exist in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant. Inverse tangent only works between minus 90 and 90. Right? It adds, it works if I add or subtract 180 degrees or pi radians, right? But if you just go arctan, you would get the wrong answer. What would be the arctan of this? If I did it, it would be minus 45 degrees. All right. In other words, when you take the arctan function and you do arctan of imaginary over real, it can't tell if the if the negative was on the bottom or the top of that expression, right? It's impossible to use arctan to be able to figure out what's going on. All right. <clears throat> so something to be mindful of, both in this class and 2254. Right, and the, and the thing I said the other day is I said the vector that is farther ahead in the counterclockwise direction is the one that is leading, right? So in this case, V in and V out, which one is leading? V in, right? And, and the way I can tell this from looking at the time domain waveform is I see that V in has its positive peak at an earlier time, so he's leading. Okay. All right, so... Where we wrapped up on Friday was trying to use these concepts in circuits. And I was trying to generalize this idea of impedance from resistance, all right? So you guys know Ohm's law is V equals IR, right? I wanna use the same thing or develop the same thing for a circuit that has L's and C's, okay? So we went through this analysis the other day and I said, okay, let's say I put a voltage source across the resistor. We already know if I put a voltage cross source across the resistor and I wanna figure out what the current is, it's V divided by R, right? And so what I have is that the amplitude of the current is the amplitude of the voltage divided by the resistance, okay? Pretty straightforward. Is there a shift in angle at all? No, right? And the voltage and current would look like whatever I have right there. They would be lined up with each other, okay? Now, where we started talking was about a capacitor. And this is where we ended the other day. So what I did was I put a voltage source across my capacitor. My voltage source is basically that guy, V of T is V cosine omega T plus five. Okay. And then what I did is I said, okay, what's the phasor of that? Well, it's whatever the amplitude of the voltage is with that angle five V. Okay. Then what I did was I said, I want to figure out what I of T is. So I is equal to C times the derivative. And I ended up with this whole expression right here, all right? Now, I of T is equal to this thing at the bottom. So just to be clear, what's the amplitude of this particular waveform? So I of T, after I did my calculus here, I of T was that, okay? What's the amplitude of that waveform? Omega CV, not negative omega CV, right? Not negative omega CV, everybody falls for that trick, right? The negative is, so amplitude is always a positive number. What's the negative sign mean? It does what? Flip, well, so it flips it, right? So it's a, it, depending, on, depending on your perspective, it flips it over the, the axis or it shifts it left or right. So it's a phase shift. It changes the angle, right? So negative one is a complex number, is it not? All numbers are complex numbers, I guess. But negative one has an angle and a magnitude. What's the magnitude and angle of negative one? One's the magnitude. What's its angle? 180. Okay. Right? <clears throat> so by multiplying, if I if I think about what's going on here, this guy is a 180 degree shift. So basically I take Instead of having a negative one out there, I can add a 180 in here. All right. So I did this example here where it's fully derived out. All right. Um, and I said basically what this kind of means for us. Let's take let's take a close look at an example. So in this this example here that I did, 
All right. What I have is um, omega times C, whatever value that is, is one. Okay. And whatever the amplitude of the voltage is here is one. Okay. So um, I shouldn't have written it in there for you guys right off the bat. But if I look at this picture here, what I'm saying is, is that V of T, all right, the voltage. So that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm putting a voltage across this guy. And the voltage I'm putting across it is cosine omega T minus 90 degrees. Okay. I of T is 90 degrees ahead of that. All right. So what I see here is that the current is leading the voltage by 90 degrees. All right. So I want to look at this in the phasor domain. I want to think about this as a phasor relationship for myself here for a second. What would be the phasor for the voltage? One angle negative 90. And the phasor for the current would be one angle zero. Now I could have written the cosine omega t minus 90 if I thought about it as sine omega t as well. That would have been fine, right? That's the same thing. I, I don't write it that way. Again, we reference our phasors always to cosine. Cosine is sort of our basic definition of things. We can't mix and match between sine and cosine. So we shift everything to cosine. Okay. All right. So what I see is there's a, if I, if I were to sketch these things in the phasor domain, phasor domain means I plot them on the, on the uh, complex plane. Where would I put the voltage and where would I put the current phasors? Negative y. So it'd be the negative y axis for the voltage. And then the current would be over here, 90 degrees ahead of it. Which one's leading? Current leads, right? I can, we, I can see it because it peaks earlier in time and its vector is, not, is more counterclockwise, more further in the, in the positive direction or counterclockwise direction, okay? All right, so <clears throat> what this, where we kind of ended with last time is I said, okay, if I think of I of T in general as having an amplitude I, and the voltage is having a, a, a magnitude, an amplitude V, okay? What I see from this in general is, we wrote out here is that I, the magnitude of I is always omega C times the magnitude of V. And there's always a 90 degree shift like that. What I said was, if, if these two things are true, I can write all of this basically compactly with complex numbers. Instead of having two equations, one for the angle and one for the magnitude, I can put them together into one complex expression, right? And so this expression here, right? This guy here is that. This guy here is that. Now, <clears throat> if, I, if I look at this here, what, how is this true? So J omega C like that. What's how would how did I how did I get from this expression here to this one and this one? How did I do that? How can I do that? Well, yeah. So if I look at this and I say, okay, I have a, I have a complex number, right? If I have a equals b times c right? A, B, and C all be in complex numbers. And I said to you, all right, what's the magnitude of A? How would I, what's, what would be the magnitude of A? If I knew what B and C were, right? let's say B and C were just complex numbers that I knew what their values were, what would the magnitude of A be? In terms of the in terms of B and C, what's the magnitude of A? No. In terms of A, what's so in terms of whatever you know about B and C, what would be the magnitude of A? Magnitude of B times the magnitude of C, right? So the magnitude of A is always the magnitude of B times the magnitude of C. Like that. What do we know about their angles? 
following the same thing. If I take two complex numbers and multiply them together, the what do we know about the angle of A? How do I relate the angles? Angle B plus angle C, right? You guys see complex numbers, that should be in your brain by now, okay? This is stuff you guys are covering in 2254, and I know you are, all right? So you need to you need to know that, right? That's what I did here. Where the hell did the 90 degrees come from? That's the same thing I did here, right? I said the magnitude of I, right? The magnitude of this is equal to the magnitude of J omega C, which is omega C, times the magnitude of P, right? Where does the 90 degrees come from? Where the 90 degrees come from? No. Looking at this expression right here, all right? If we just say, just to be clear, all right? Let's just say that um, I is equal to uh, whatever the magnitude of I is with an angle of I. And let's say V is equal to whatever the magnitude of V is with an angle of V, like that. Okay. Why did I say the angle of I is 90 degrees plus the angle of V? Just look at this expression right here. Because I have a J omega C, right? So the angle of J omega C is what? The angle of J omega C, well, it's arc 10 of omega C divided by zero, right? What's that? Sometimes you got to think about where the angle, where this thing actually sits in the complex plane, right? If I have zero plus J omega C, where does he point? Straight up, right? That's 90 degrees is his angle. So that's where the 90 degrees come from. The angle of J times anything is 90 degrees, okay? And so if I, if I look at this expression here, I have I equals something times V. What does that look like? I equals something times V. Tell me you know what that is. I equals something times V. I equals something times V. Looks like Ohm's law to me, right? Doesn't it? Yeah, where, where that, where that, whatever that something is would be a resistance. And that's what you guys have seen previously, right? So that something in this case is a complex number. And we call that in general, the impedance. And so if I write it as V equals I times something, the something is written as Z, all right? And that Z is a vector. So the fact that it's a vector expresses what? Magnitude and direction, yeah. Basically, it tells me that for all these sinusoidal waveforms, what we said is gonna happen is the amplitude's gonna change and the angle's gonna change. So I see it right here. Right? The voltage and current, how are they related to each other? Angle of the voltage is always equal to the angle of the current plus the angle of the impedance. That's what that expression, V equals I, Z says. The angle of V is the angle of I plus 90 degrees, right? And the magnitude of V is always equal to what? <laughs> Magnitude of I times the magnitude of Z, right? It's it's fairly straightforward. It's a generalization of what you already know. Ohm's law as V equals I R totally fits within this framework. Because what's the angle of a resistance? If I give you a resistor, any resistor in the world, what's its angle? Zero. Which means there's no phase shift between the current and the voltage. You never worried about that. Okay. And we never have to worry about that for a resistor. All right. <clears throat> so we summarize all that stuff here. All right. Um, now I want to talk about an inductor. Okay. All right. What's an inductor going to do? Well, we know in general. All right. We'll we'll skip the drama, and I'll say basically somehow I know that I better have some phasor relationship v equals i times z. Okay. That better work out in the end. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a current source across this guy. All right. And I'm going to say that that current source is I of t equals I cosine omega t plus phi. All right, like that. All right, so help me out. How would I figure out the voltage in general on that thing, on that inductor? 
take the derivative, right? So I get, so it's, this is no fun. I got to do calculus. This, this is the important thing with this is with the analysis that I'm talking about here, and I'll stress this point a couple of times, calculus has left the, the equations basically. The time domain piece meant that I had to do derivatives with respect to time. So I had to do calculus. When I got to this V equals I Z part, which only holds in the special case where I'm worried about steady state, then I don't need to do any calculus. It's back to algebra, right? So in other words, it's, it's just an algebraic thing, although it's complex algebra, it's got complex numbers, right? It's just algebra. And so it's a lot simpler than it is having to do calculus, right? Simpler in the context of less work, right, to do, all right? All right, so V of T, I got to do calculus at least here at the beginning. So it's L di dt. All right, so help me out. How do I do the derivative of I? So this is L times D by dt of I cosine omega T plus phi. Help me out. How do I do that? What's the derivative of cosine omega T? Negative omega sine t, yeah, you got it. So, so it's negative omega l i sine omega t plus phi. Again, we said we don't ever like sine functions. Okay, maybe you don't. So, in terms of the the way we think about this, we don't we don't like mixing and matching sine and cosine. So, what I do is I get this to an equivalent cosine. So how do I get that to an equivalent cosine? Subtract 90, so this comes, becomes negative omega L I cosine omega T plus phi minus 90 degrees, like that. I also don't ever like having a negative sign out in front because the negative sign doesn't change the amplitude. It's not part of the amplitude. But negative one is what? 180 degrees. So basically this becomes omega L I cosine omega T plus phi minus 90 degrees plus 180 degrees. So what's that become? If I have 180 minus 90, it's what? 90. This guy becomes omega L I cosine omega T plus phi plus 90 degrees. Okay. All right. So I want, I want, now I want to look at this in the context of phase one. All right. And I'm going to say this guy becomes um what am i gonna call it i'm gonna call it v cosine omega t plus phi v so looking at this i can see that v equals what if these two expressions are equal to each other those last two lines are equal to each other tell me what v right here has to be omega l omega l i right omega l i and phi v has to be equal to what? Phi plus 90, right? Phi plus 90 degrees. So what I see here is that, let's think about this. Um, the magnitude of V is omega L times the magnitude of I. The angle of the voltage is 90 degrees ahead of the angle of the current, all right? So I want to do this in terms of phasors for a second, right? I of t is I cosine omega t plus phi. What's the phasor for this character? So I'd say this is I has a magnitude of I and his angle is phi, okay? What about for V here? So V of t, right? V of t, that guy has a phasor V. His magnitude is V and his angle is 5v. Looking at this, I can see that the magnitude of v, which I call just v, right, is omega l times the magnitude of i. And I can see that the angle of v, right, the angle of v, which I called 5v, is equal to the angle of i plus 90 degrees. Okay. All right, so what I see is that the magnitude of the voltage is omega L times the magnitude of the current. 
The angle of the voltage is the angle of I plus 90 degrees. That seems to fit into that same V equals Z times I framework, right? What would Z be in this case? So if I think about this, what would Z be in this particular case? Omega L is the magnitude of it. And the angle of Z is 90 degrees. So this guy basically tells me that Z is equal to J omega L, all right? So now I've got everything I need to know. I'm gonna come back and do my example here in some more detail, but I'm gonna skip ahead for a second. Here's the summary of all of it right now, okay? The impedance of a resistor is R, okay? We knew that already. You didn't know it was impedance, but basically what's it tell me? It's a, it's a real number. And it always has to have an angle of what for a resistor? Better be an angle of zero. What's that mean to say it's an angle of zero? Well, sure, we could, we could take it trigonom trigonometrically and everything you just said is right, okay? But physically, what does it mean to me to say that it has an angle of zero? It's no shift, yeah, exactly. If I went in the lab and I, measured, and I put a voltage across that resistor and I measured the current through that resistor, they'd be perfectly aligned with each other. Here, all right, capacitor is one over J omega C, ZL is J omega L, okay? What, so what's the angle of the, let's, let's do the easy one first. If I wrote this guy in the polar form, J omega L, how would I write that? I wrote that in polar form. What's polar form? It's the other form. Right. This is rectangular form. Zero plus J omega L, right? So what is what would it be? Polar form, I need a what and a what? Magnitude and angle. What's the what's the magnitude of omega L? It's omega L, right? What's the angle of J omega L? 90 degrees. Okay. What about for this character over here? Well, that's weird because I got the J on the bottom. But one thing, you know, I don't ever write it this way, but I can say this is also the same as negative J over omega C, right? That, that's an equivalent statement. Where does that guy sit? What's his angle, negative J omega C? What's that? 270. Yeah, and typically we say minus 90. Okay. But you're correct, it would be 270. Usually for, for anything, um, usually we, we use positives for zero to 180 and we use negatives for anything from 180 to 360, all right? That's just, that's just a standard way of writing. Right? It's not wrong to say 270, but that's sort of the standard way that we do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so if I have negative, so if I have the vector zero minus, 3j, right? One over omega c is a number. Let's say it was three. Where does that vector sit in the complex plane? If you sketch that vector in the complex plane, it would point straight down. That's an angle of 270 or negative 90. Okay. All right. So here's this is the summary of everything. We're going to deal with this a lot. The cool thing about this is this is this turns all of our analysis into algebraic analysis. All right, instead of, instead of calculus. So long as we're worried about steady state, if I have any circuit with R's, L's, and C's, all of my analysis is, is now algebraic instead of calculus-based. And all of the stuff that we've done before, if I have impedances in series, what do you think happens to them? They add, just like resistances in series, okay? If I have uh, impedances in parallel, they add like resistances in parallel. If I have a voltage divider that consists of an R and a C, it's the same as a resistor divider, right? Uh, if I have a current divider that has a bunch of impedances, it acts like a regular current divider. So as I said, one of the things I've been saying is that, okay, from this point forward, we're basically gonna repeat 2111, right? Except we're gonna use complex numbers, right? So we're gonna do mesh analysis and we're gonna do uh, nodal and all that stuff, right? But we're basically gonna do it with complex numbers now, all right? But it's all the same stuff, okay? So we're gonna look at some examples now. Yeah, question? Oh. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so 
where um, you can go go through this, but I, I you know I put some basically I stopped with the inductor, right? I I don't want to labor the math, but this is the same analysis here, and I see that there's a 90 degree shift between the voltage across the inductor and the current through the inductor, right? <clears throat> and I can relate that into the phasor domain, but I want to take take a look at sort of an example of how I would use this in circuit analysis, right? So here's here's my circuit up top. Now the way the way a circuit sometimes it, we talk about things in the time domain and the phasor domain. So up here I've got the time domain. To me, sometimes this time domain. When I say time domain, what I mean is that all of the voltages there are a function of time, right? V sub c of t, i sub c of t. This is v n of t. That's that's probably an abstract thing to you guys. This is where, if I was in the lab, what I would say is. This is what exists in the real world, right? If I if I go and I built the circuit, right? If I built that circuit, I put an R and a C in series, and I got the function generator on my bench top and hooked up my function generator as my input. This would be perfect for the function generator. Good range for it. It's a what frequency is that? F? Thousand. Thousand. So it's one kilohertz, right? So I got one kilohertz with an amplitude of four, right? I could easily dial that in on my function generator and build this circuit with an R and a C. And those are R's and C's that should be available in the lab. If I wanted to see the voltage across the capacitor, I'd use an oscilloscope, right? And, and I'd see it, you know, as a sine wave kind of unfolding, right? So that, that's the time domain. That's the real world, right? So if I measure signals in the real world, they're going to look like sine waves. But in reality, what I often do is I go into what I call the phasor domain for analysis. All right. This is not a place where I can make measurements. I can't go in the lab and you can get some tools, but it's not a common tool to have. Right. <clears throat> I, I can't see the phasor domain, but it's where analysis is easiest. OK, so in the phasor domain, I'm going to say that I replace V in with the phasor V in. And I replace V sub C with the phasor V sub C. And I replace the current with the phasor I sub C. So everything here, these voltages and currents, these are complex numbers. Everything up there in the time domain is basically a, a function of time. And again, that's what happens in the real world, right? If you if you stick your hand in the wall socket, don't do that. But if you do it with one hand, you'll feel it. It'll, you'll feel the pulsation, right? It is changing as a function of time, getting bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, right? This is basically the way we do our analysis, okay? All right, so first thing I got to do is I got to figure out, I got to do some, some conversions and phasers and stuff like that. So I want to use my results here. So I know that the impedance of a resistor is R, and I know that the impedance of a capacitor is um, one over J omega C. All right. First thing I want to do is, all right, so V in, all right, I want to write V in the phaser here. What is the phaser for four cosine two pi one thousand t? Four angle zero. Four angle zero. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to figure out the phaser for I sub c next. Right. Any ideas how I would do that? Four over the total impedance of the circuit. All right. So I sub C would be equal to Vn divided by the total impedance in the circuit, which is Z sub R plus Z sub C. They're in series with each other. So I sub C, so Vn is on top, divided by Z sub R plus, one over, plus ZC. Z sub R is R. What is Z sub C? One over J omega C. Now let's stop and do some calculations for ourselves here. So one over J omega C, I'm gonna do that first, right? So Z sub C is one over J omega C, okay? Let's do that in uh, polar form. What's the magnitude of that? 
What would the magnitude of that be? Give me some numbers based on what I got over here. It's one over omega C. So help me out. Give me some numbers that I want to plug in here. One over what times what? One microfarad. So my so my C would be 10 to the minus six. And what's my omega? Two pi one thousand. Okay. And what's the angle of this thing? The angle is negative 90 degrees. Okay. Because of the one over J. Okay. So if I work out that number, I work out to be 159.1549 ohms. It still has units of ohms. Okay. With an angle of negative 90 degrees. What's Z sub R? Well, it's whatever R is, which is apparently 15.9 kilo ohms. Okay. All right. So if I want to figure out IC, I plug everything in here, right? So I'm going to do this over here. So I'm going to say VN, or sorry, I sub C, the phaser, is equal to VN, the phaser, divided by what? 15.9 kilo ohms. So 15.9 times 10 to the third plus one over J omega C, which was apparently 159.1549 with an angle of negative 90 degrees. Okay. I go through and do my analysis on this particular thing and I end up with um, 200 and 51.56 microamps with an angle of 0.5735 degrees. Okay. 251 microamps. What is that? What would that be? 251 times 10 to the negative 6. So 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.000251. All right. So that's the current in this particular circuit. Now, so if I wanted to see what this thing looked like in the time domain, what would it look like in the time domain? Now let's just let's be clear. So let's do the phaser domain. So my voltage is basically four. So here's the voltage. Where would where would this be? Point two fifty one point five six microamps with an angle of point five seven three five. Less than, one up. less than one degree up, which is basically sitting at zero, right? It's almost impossible to see that. And you'd be super tiny, All right? So I'm exaggerating if I show on that. Okay. Now, what will the voltage across the capacitor look like? Say I wanted to figure out what the voltage across the capacitor was. How would I figure that out? Yeah, current times its impedance, I'd say IC times ZC, okay? Which would be what? Well, one over omega C times whatever the magnitude of IC is. What would the angle be? What would the angle be? Well, it'd be, it's gonna be whatever the angle of the current is plus the angle of this guy. Right, so the angle of the current is apparently 0.5735 degrees. What's the angle of Z sub C? Negative 90 degrees, okay? So negative 90, basically it's gonna end up being negative 90, right? All right it's gonna be like negative 89 point something, okay? So let's look at, now again, in the time domain, this is what those things are going to look like. Vn is this guy here. I see that he's got an amplitude of four, right? I can see that here. The, let's look at the current next, okay? The current has the right amplitude, basically 250 microamps. Look at the top graph and the bottom graph, top and bottom, right? What do I notice about the phase angle of those? 
they look basically the same. They look pretty much lined up with each other. That's they're shifted by 0.57 degrees. That's you can't see 0.57 degrees of shift. All right. So they basically look the same. Now, how does the voltage across the capacitor relate to that current? What's it look like? So the way I look like I look at this is I see here's the angle of the current. Or here's the way. So how do I get the angle between those two particular waveforms? So I sub C here and V sub C here. So I sub C on the bottom, V sub C in the middle. How can I tell the phase angle between the two of them? So you can see that the, the peak is where one of them is at the bottom, right? Yeah, so the, I measure the, the angle by looking at the peak of one and the peak of the other. How long does it take to get between them? So <clears throat> what's it look like here? If I, if I looked closely, I would see that the angle is about 90 degrees, which is what it, in fact, it's not about, it is 90 degrees. That's what it's supposed to be. Right. And which one is leading? The current or the voltage? Current. The current leads the voltage, right? And that's exactly what it should do, right? The angle of the voltage is the angle of the current minus 90 degrees. So the current is 90 degrees ahead of the voltage. All right. So, and I, and I can see that more closely here when I look at this picture kind of zoomed in. What I can see here is that wherever the current's at zero, the voltage is at its peak. That's if there's if one's at its zero crossing when the other one at its peak, that's basically a 90 degree phase difference. And the current is leading because he peaks before the voltage does in time. Okay. So basically, you know, our approach from this point forward is basically to say, all right. If I do all of my analysis here in the phasor domain, beginning of the problem, I map my circuit from the time domain to the phasor domain, do all my analysis, and then map it back. That way, I don't ever have to do any calculus. Right? That's the whole reason why we're doing it, to get away from calculus. It, Like I said, it, it takes something that's grungy and makes it, I don't know, grungy is not the right word. I know it's bad bad terminology here, but it takes something that's, that's ugly in terms of the differential equations and makes it weird in the context of complex numbers. But the complex number is useful because it allows me to track an angle and a magnitude simultaneously. And that's the usefulness of it. All right, <clears throat> and that is it.